This is a radiation detector, and this is a Ferrari, and that sound is telling us that this Ferrari is radioactive, but they certainly don't come this way. So what do you think happened to this Ferrari? You may remember this Ferrari from a What's In It Wednesday where we used x-ray imaging to perform radiography and see directly through the car. And since then, we've done a full 3D imaging of the car, known as a tomography. But neither of these non-destructive imaging techniques would make the car radioactive. So in order to understand the story, we have to introduce a whole new field of imaging. So strap in and beam on as we explore the weird and wonderful world of neutron imaging. And to discuss further, here's Tomo Man. Hello, it's me, Tomo Man, and today we're going to be talking about the nuances of neutron tomography. For instance, what is a neutron? And how can we gather them and use them to take images? Let's get into it. Bestowed with the brilliance of a thousand synchrotrons, he is Tomo Man. Flying through the sky at half the speed of light, he got super strength and x-ray eyes, he's Tomo Man. So let's discuss the nuances of neutron imaging and neutron computed tomography. First, I'd like to start off with what is a neutron? And to understand the neutron, we have to look back on the atom. This, for example, is a lithium atom. A lithium atom has three protons and three electrons to keep it charged neutral. As well as these subatomic particles, we also have neutrons. A neutron falls into the category of subatomic particles because it's one of the things that atoms are made out of. Now the weight of a neutron is about 1.675 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, and also it has no charge. Now that we know what a neutron is and where to find them in nature, how do we generate the neutrons that we would utilize for neutron imaging? The process of generating neutrons that we will focus on today is called spallation. And to visualize the process of spallation, I have this great video from Isis, Neutron, and Muon Source. Here we can see a linear accelerator accelerating protons into a booster ring. The booster ring pushes the protons to higher and higher speeds. Once the desired velocity is reached, this high velocity proton will be guided down another tube towards a tungsten target, where it will collide and create all the neutrons that we would use for science. So a spallation source is a pulsed source, where the generation of neutrons comes from the high energy impact of a proton beam with a tungsten target, providing us with a brilliant source of neutrons which can be used in a wide array of research applications. Now if we took the example of using these neutrons for imaging, the setup would be quite like what we covered in the last lecture with X-ray computer tomography. You have your radiation source, your sample, and your detector. When the radiation goes through the sample, it's attenuated and therefore it loses intensity. And this relationship between the initial intensity and the final intensity and the interaction with the radiation in the sample can be described by the Beer-Lambert law, which is I is equal to I naught multiplied by E to the negative mu D, where mu is our attenuation coefficient. The attenuation coefficient, which is plotted here for both x-rays and neutrons versus atomic number, is where x-ray and neutron imaging begins to differ quite a lot. If you look at the trend for x-rays, the increasing blue line tells us that the attenuation coefficient generally increases with atomic number. But if you look at the relationship between attenuation coefficient and atomic number for neutrons, it's quite chaotic. And this difference has an effect on what we see when we image. The difference comes from how the radiation interacts with the sample. X-rays interact with the electron cloud of an atom, and neutrons interact with the nucleus of the atom. To put it quite simply, X-rays and neutrons just see differently. And as an example of this, I have two pictures of the same camera, one taken with X-rays and the other taken with neutrons. With the X-rays, you can see a lot more detail in the metals. And the thing that sticks up the most is the triangular piece and that cylindrical piece over to the left, which don't really show up in the x-rays at all, but have a very high contrast in the neutron image. This is likely because these materials are made of plastic, which is hard to show up in x-rays when you have metal components as well, but also hydrogen abundant, which makes it highly attenuating to neutrons. 
Another cool property about neutrons is that they are isotope sensitive. This means that the attenuation of the neutron also depends on the isotope. And to give you a refresher on isotopes, if we go back to the lithium atom that we showed before, this is actually a lithium-7 atom because we can see four neutrons, so that would be lithium-7. If we were to take away one of these neutrons, we'd be left with lithium-6, the same element but two different isotopes. And in neutron imaging, certain isotopes will have a higher attenuation. That means that the same element can have different contrasts. And for an example of this from my own work, this is a lithium-lithium solid electrolyte cell consisting of two pieces of lithium separated by a solid electrolyte. One of these lithiums is lithium-7 while the other is lithium-6. You can see on the left of this solid electrolyte is what looks like a gap, but that's actually lithium-7. And then on the right, you see this very dark area. This is lithium-6. It's amazing to see how the same element can look so different depending on the isotope. This is certainly a strong nuance in neutron imaging. But once you gather the two-dimensional neutron projection, the process becomes exactly the same as we did for X-ray imaging. You gather projections at different angles, and then use the computer to reconstruct the 3D volume. This gives you the 3D image that you're used to seeing, and you can now probe the interior volume of the sample. But in this case, it would be a neutron tomogram. And now that you understand the basics of neutron imaging, we can go back to our story of the radioactive Ferrari because this Ferrari took a very special trip to Isis Neutron and Muon Source, more specifically the imaging and diffraction branch known as IMAT. And as you can imagine, IMAT is a huge, awe-inspiring and complex instrument used for imaging with neutrons, but we can break it down into the fundamental components. You've got the source, the sample, and the detector. And in this case, the sample was the Ferrari. Once it was mounted in place between the source and the detector, we're able to produce neutron radiographies. And as you can see in these pictures, the darker areas are the little plastic bits like the wheels and the seat and the, even the steering wheel. This is because these plastic parts are abundant in hydrogen, which is highly attenuating to the neutrons. Whereas the metal outer body of the car is now barely visible. This is almost exactly the opposite of what we see with x-rays, where by the time we get through the metal pieces and we see them just fine, we can now no longer see the plastics. But rather than seeing these data sets as simply opposites of one another, we can think of them as complementary data sets. And when you utilize x-rays and neutrons together, you get the full story of your sample. The best part is that both techniques are non-destructive, so you don't harm your sample. But you do have to keep in mind when working with neutrons, the process of neutron activation, which is exactly what happened to the Ferrari. Because the neutrons interact with the nucleus of the sample, it can be destabilized and cause the sample to become temporarily radioactive. This is part of the safety procedure at IMAT, so the Ferrari will be temporarily living there. So that's all for today. I hope you found some interesting tips. I'll invite you to check out our previous lectures if you haven't already, and subscribe for more to keep up to date with all of our rad science. Thanks!